What's up, y'all? So by popular demand, I have a 2022 version of my exercise tier list. The last one didn't include things like lat exercises or rows or pull-ups or anything like that, ab exercises, things of that nature. This is going to include some of my favorite exercises and then just some that I've also tried or that you know my clients have tried in the past, and then we'll rank them accordingly based upon their experience or my experience with it. A couple things to note with the tier list before you know we get into it. They're ranked in my mind in different categories, and we're going to talk about why I rank them, you know, for example, on S tier or A tier or whatever. There's different categories that contribute to how much utility an exercise has, and that's how this is ranked, right? It's just like a fighting game. If an S tier character is S tier, that doesn't necessarily mean they're just across the board better than a C tier character in every category. So you can be an S tier character and say Street Fighter, for example, and your damage could be trash compared to a D tier character, but you're better than them in every other category that matters. So you're an S tier and they're a D tier. Same thing. So if there's a D tier exercise that you really like using for a specific reason, say like Zercher squats are not the best exercise. Don't argue with me about how you think they're a good exercise for the purpose that you use. More than likely, I agree with you. It's just overall utility. A Zercher squat isn't as good as a high bar squat in terms of overall utility. That's just objective fact, for example. So just keep that in mind. So we're going to get right into it, starting with the obvious ones. The, the, the golden five, I think, is what Arnold Schwarzenegger used to call them. We're going to do the bench press, squat, deadlift row and pull up and then the overhead press. So I guess it's the golden six. I don't know what the fuck he called it, but the main compound movements that you should be basing your program off of in general, I'm trying to use the touch pad like a fucking five head, five head giga brain. So we're going to start with the high bar squat S tier. High bar squats are really good in terms of the stimulus that they offer to your leg in general. You can do them a little wider to get a little more adductors. You can do them a little narrower to get a little more glutes. But across the board, range of motion equalized. They're going to stretch the shit out of your quads and give you a really good stimulus. They're the exercise that is used as like a main power development tool in most strength and conditioning programs for non-strength athletes for a reason. They're better than deadlifts in that they do have a better stimulus to fatigue ratio. So by that, I mean that for the amount of stimulus that you get for it, there is a lower amount of fatigue with a squat versus a deadlift. It's not like a low fatigue exercise, but it's not as demanding as a deadlift objectively. For that reason, and then just so much more provided with you know the different variations of a high bar squat you can do. You can do a tempo high bar squat. You can do a pause high bar squat. Um, long pause high bar squat. There's a lot of different ways you could program the squat in general. It's just there's not an, uh, an exercise I can think of that has more utility for the lower body for the most part. So squat is easily S tier. We're going to go with bench press, specifically the competition bench press. I'm pretty sure I used a uh, power lifter for this. Well, fuck it. We'll do the Larson press because that's what I see first. Larson press is not F tier. I, I had to scroll it up there to get it on the board. Larson press, I would say. I'm going to put it in S tier, but I'm not going to say that it's necessarily better than a regular bench press. Just that it has a lot of utility that when you when you're in the right space to be using a Larson press, you definitely should be using it. Because you're not using leg drive, you get a, what's the non-galaxy brain way to say this? The stretch you get at the bottom is more significant because you're not using leg drive. So it's a better bodybuilding movement than a regular bench press. The load is lower for the amount of stimulus that you get. So it has a higher stimulus and a low fatigue. And then as well... If you're doing proper leg drive, like I've said time and time again, there is a fatigue aspect that comes into play with your lower body. If you don't feel that way, 
I don't care how strong you are. I don't care if you're stronger than me. You don't know how to use leg drive and you've never felt what a proper bench press feels like. It's not a comfortable exercise by any means, especially not if you're doing it for multiple sets, multiple reps. So for all those reasons, I'm putting Larson Press in S tier. We'll just, I can't look for particular exercises, y'all. So I did just happen to find the competition bench press. We're going to also put that in S tier, but I'm not going to go for particular exercises. I'm just going to, you know, click and go and then talk about them as we go because there's just way too many. Competition bench press, though, I would say is definitely an S tier. Like it's the most easily loadable upper body exercise that I can think of besides like a weighted push up. The range of motion on it is good unless you do things like arching to make it not good. It's just the overall bread and butter that most people are going to eventually use at some point. Now, I've made statements in the past, or I guess in the past, last week, saying that weighted push-ups are a better option for like weaker beginners than a bench press, just because there are legitly some people that are so neurologically maladapted and just clumsy in terms of their body awareness. And this is just from working with actual people in person. You can coach anybody to be good for the bench press. In the midst of you doing those things, you do the push-up. So the push-up is just more intuitive for most people to do correctly. All you have to uh, like check for is just the depth, making sure that the range of motion is like good. They're going through a full range of motion. And then in addition to that, then that's when you help them through whatever bench press cues they need to not look like a like a Bambi, you know what I'm saying? Like a baby deer. You know how they walk all awkward when they're first born like that? That's how people look on bench press. So you see like really lopsided lockouts and it just looks like a soup sandwich. That's not a fault of the exercise, though. That's just, you know, a, a maladapted, you know, newer lifter. But overall, bench press is an S tier exercise. Next, we're going to do the assault bike, my, my nemesis, the assault bike, Chad. I haven't actually seen that dude in a long time. He's cool. The assault bike, I would definitely say is S tier. It's not a good hypertrophy exercise, obviously, because it's, it's a cardio tool, but there are a lot of things that just make it have infinite utility in everybody's training program, provided that you have access to one. If you don't have access to one and you have the means to buy one, definitely get them because with the assault bike, you get to work through knee extension and knee flexion through infinity number of reps for zero fatigue, provided that you're pedaling at a low to moderate pace. You can get blood flowing through your every tendon in your leg and knee, to be honest with you. So something really cool that the knees over toes guy talks about. And nothing that he talks about is new. Like it's none of his principles are his. They've been out for decades. It's just that he commercialized them. But something that he talks about is easy ways to get into that knees over toes posture if you have knee pain that are like regressions of a barbell squat. The assault bike is one of the most intuitive, in my opinion. So if you pedal in reverse, if you look in the mirror, what you'll notice is, is that you're doing a knees over toes every rep, except for it's very fast and repeatable, and it's very low weight. You're going to get an excellent pump in your VMO. You're going to get blood flowing through everywhere in your knee. It's just going to be the most epic, I guess you could say, squat warm-up that you've ever experienced in your life. If you've been having knee pain, just this alone, maybe 10 minutes before you start squatting is going to help you feel really good. And then just in general, it's a good conditioning tool as well. So if you notice that like your work capacity is trash, you just add this between your sets for a few weeks, your work capacity is going to be good. Next, we're going to, I don't know why there's two ab wheels there. Maybe that's the assault bike chat trying to establish, establish dominance. We're going to do the Dr. Mike style ATG leg press specifically because leg press the way most people do it is garbage. It's a be, what's something smaller than a quarter rep, like an eighth rep. I literally see people in the gym all the time. I'm not naming no names, but they go to the gym and then they basically just like bend their knees a little bit and call it a leg press. It's not a leg press. I think that the Dr. Mike ATG leg press is also S tier. Just because, again, we're talking in terms of utility. This and this have equal utility, 
in terms of just putting overall size on you. So the leg press honestly would be a little bit better in terms of the stimulus to fatigue ratio just because it's not fatiguing your back at all. Dr. Mike has made tons of videos showing how to set up the ATG leg press safely so that you don't round your back. So if you're a DL or a boomer that thinks that your back is going to get smashed to bits by doing a leg press with any range of motion, there are doctors that beg to differ with you. Uh, there, there is a way that you can set this up using extra padding or Olympic weightlifting shoes or whatever you need to do for you to be able to use a good range of motion on this. It's basically like, and there's a few other exercises that I'll put kind of in this same category. It's basically like free tonnage for your legs. You can push your legs, like your quads, your adductors and everything, a lot harder than you think you can in absence of like your lower back and your core strength and everything like that. That's infinitely valuable in terms of hypertrophy. If you're having a plateau in your squatting strength and that's one of your main exercises you use to build your body, this is one of the best accessory exercises that you can do for it. Next is the GHD back extension. The GHD back extension, I'm also going to put an S tier. I just happen to be subconsciously picking a lot of S tier exercises or running into them. But the GHD back extension is really good. It has a very good stimulus to fatigue ratio. It's easy to load. You know, you can load up as much or as little as five pounds, 200 pounds, and everything in between. The reason why I like this more than a 45 degree one is that when you get more range of motion and because of the joint angle, you get a bigger stretch on your, uh, I, I don't, I don't want to use the curse word, but on your glutes. I'm trying to keep this as curse word free as possible. Uh, but you get a bigger stretch on your glutes because y'all know I, uh, I have a sailor mouth, but you get a bigger stretch on your glutes. And what I feel like is a better isometric contraction on your spinal erectors as well. My lower back doesn't get pumped on anything quite like it does on back extensions on the 90 degree GHD or whatever you have that could set that up. It's really good also for if you have an injury where if you have any sort of shear or axial load on your spine, it causes pain. This is one of the exercises that I used in my you know recovery process after I broke my back to not only rehypertrophy my atrophied muscles, but further hypertrophy them from pre-injury. You know what I mean? Like they're infinite utility. If you're doing a really squat intensive program and you're on the leaner side, you might find that you're not able to do things like deadlifts and stiff leg deadlifts just because you don't have the recovery economy to do so, but you can always fit in back extensions. Next, we have the barbell shrug. The barbell shrug, honestly, bro, I'm going to put it in C tier. It's not bad. It's just not particularly good at anything that it's accomplishing. And there are exercises from the same category that do things better. So the barbell shrug is something that you can do if, you know, you're not doing anything like an overhead press, which works your traps really well. You're not doing, you know, like a trap bar shrug, which is way better than a barbell shrug because of the way that your muscles insert. It's just a more natural and full contraction, and you're not really limited by your grip as much with a a trap bar versus, you know, the barbell, just by nature of uh, it being a neutral grip versus the, the barbell, which can roll, roll in your hand. It's not bad. Like I said, it's not a D tier or an F tier exercise. Even a D tier exercise, I wouldn't say is useless, but there's just a lot of ex other exercises that do what this does and then a bunch of other things, or it may do just, you know, building your traps better than this does. So you can include them if you like them or if you love them, but they're not on the same echelon as these exercises in terms of hypertrophying your body or their utility in general, I would say. So another one that I want to rank is the rear delt fly. The rear delt fly, honestly, bro, I'm not even going to put it in D tier. This is an F tier exercise. Now, a lot of y'all might be like old school bodybuilders old school recreational lifters, you might have a certain amount of experience in the gym and you're like, well, rear delt flies aren't F tier, dude. What are you talking about? You have to work your rear delts. And I agree. 
But when you look at the effective range of motion of a rear delt fly, you're really only getting an effective range of motion at like the top fourth of the movement. The rest of this is almost completely null and devoid of any stimulus on your rear delts at all. So you, you, you mean to tell me that if you had to compare a quarter squat to a full range of motion squat, that it would be any way comparable? Like if you had to compare them on a sliding scale, the quarter squat would be on the opposite end of the spectrum. And then the full range of motion squat would be on the, the, the good and usable end of the spectrum. It's the, kind of the same thing. Now, I do think that rear delt work is really, you know, a mandatory part of your training program, whether you do that through barbell rows or good isolation. So that's why I am going to take some time to look through these for a rear delt exercise that I would consider to be a million times better. So two that I think that are better just in general are the Powell rays. And then you can do rear delt flies with cables on a machine like this. The reason being is that one, one you get far more of an effective range of motion. I'm going to put these in B tier for a reason we're going to talk about in a little bit. They are really good, but A tier belongs to some, another category of movements. But they're really good because you get a more effective range of motion. It's... Lighten your rear delt up from the start of the range of motion to the end of the range of motion. You're going to feel your rear delt lighting up. It's just a far better exercise. In that same tier, I'm going to look through here and find the power raise. The power raise is the same thing as that cable exercise, except for, you know, you're just working your arm unilaterally. There is a, a fringe benefit to that, you could say. Just because you can get somewhat of a deeper stretch because you're doing them one arm at a time, because you can kind of like twist into it a little bit, but they're not substantially different to the point where like if you like this more than this, there you know what I'm saying, or vice versa, there's no reason for you to, you know, not pick the one that you like better, because they're both pretty comparable, I would say. Dips. Now, dips are an interesting exercise because people talk about them like if you do them, they'll destroy your shoulder. If you have good scapular movement and you know how to move your scaps during just presses in general, dips are not going to hurt your shoulder. If they're hurting your shoulder, you're doing them wrong. The reason why I don't put them in A tier or S tier is just because I feel like overall weighted push-ups and bench press is a better exercise for most people. Now, some people are gonna look at this and say, well, dips work much better for me than bench press because bench press hurts my shoulder. And it's the same thing. Bench press hurts your shoulder because you don't know what you're doing. Look up my video, uh, the final answer on leg drive and bench press safety. It talks about scapular movement on the bench press and how to set up leg drive for uh, performance and safety on the bench press as well. Also, like dips for me and for most people I've encountered don't really light up the prime movers the same way a weighted push-up will. Like they'll work. Like certainly if you get like a four-plate weighted dip, you're not going to have like a bird chest, but I just don't feel like they activate your chest quite as much as say, for example, a weighted, dip, uh, weighted push-up or a bench press in my opinion. They're not a bad exercise. So like, again, if you really like them a lot more than weighted pushups, which I'm more than likely going to put in S or A tier, there's no reason why you can't do them. Like anything B to S tier is like, you know, cream of the crop exercises that you can use. Pelican curls. Pelican curls are really good just because, where'd they go? Just because they work that stretched position of the biceps. Now, stretching your biceps isn't exactly the same as stretching your hamstrings because that's like a common talking point that people use when they talk about stiff leg deadlifts. I think um, it was some debate that I watched between, uh, what's his name, Dr. Doug and Dr. Mike, where, you know, Doug was basically like, dude, well, you know, if you're saying stiff leg deadlifts are a good exercise for hamstrings because they stretch them, well, that means that 
that should apply to every other muscle. And then Dr. Mike was, you know, logically like, okay, if you had the same joint structure, and this is kind of giga brain, but we need to mention it. If you, if you equivocate, you know, equalize the structure of each muscle group, yeah, I guess you could just use stretching exercises to build your muscles. But when you do a stretch on your bicep, you're also stretching your pec and your delt. So it's not really the same thing in terms of recovery economy. That's the only reason I don't put this in like an A tier or S tier, but because it does tax your chest and your shoulder muscle at the expense of getting a bigger stretch on your bicep, which you don't typically get in most exercises that involve your bicep. I can't put it in A or S tier just because it's taking away from two big muscle groups, you know what I'm saying, just to train your biceps. That being said, it is a badass exercise. Next, we're going to do close grip bench. Close grip bench press. So this is an exercise that has been a long withstanding staple in bodybuilding programs for a reason. I'm going to put it in S tier just simply because it's going to begin to work on what will remain to be a weakness or an area of opportunity in most trainees. And that is their tricep strength and also just using a big range of motion in their movements. Close grip bench is like the first exercise that you should look at, including if your bench press is stalled. Besides like, you know, better rep quality and pausing your reps and everything like that. If your bench press is stalled as like a beginner lifter, try including like a a day of close grip bench press or some sort of tricep work. Even if you're not a beginner, just having an, uh, a variation of the bench press that does have a longer range of motion that does bias your triceps a little bit more and works your pecs a little bit more because there's a bigger range of motion, that's infinite utility in my opinion. Especially if you're someone that mainly uses bench press exercises as your um, you know, bread and butter for building the chest. So we're going to go for a lower body one. <laughs> I use the Kyriakos picture for the good morning. The good morning is really good. I don't put it in A tier just because I feel like the safety bar good morning is a better variation of this exercise than, than you know, the straight bar one. But just in general, though, if you're looking for an exercise to build your posterior chain that has a good stimulus to fatigue ratio, and this is like, I know... Kyriakos is like, you know, he trains for the difficult. He's a Chad and all that. Giga Chad, strongest natural. I really like when people do straight leg good mornings that basically simulate a stiff legged deadlift, but you just basically have the bar in your neck instead of in your hands. That's going to have a lot better of a stimulus on your spinal erectors and your hamstrings and your glutes than like a, a power good morning like what Kyriakos is doing. That being said, there is some limitation in the load that you can use on this. So unless, you know, I like to say that if you're 180 pounds, you could use probably up to 225 for reps before it has to just physically turn into a, a squat morning because of gravity. So you're a little limited on load. So you're at that point, you're either limited to slowing down your tempo or just adding a bunch of reps. And that doesn't have as much utility as say the safety bar good morning, which has the same limitation, but it also gives a host of benefits in addition to it, other than just being a good stimulus to fatigue exercise. But it's excellent, bro. Like you could include it in your training program for sure. We're actually going to go ahead and look for the safety bar good morning. So that is an exercise that I really like in comparison to the straight bar good morning. I think this is the safety bar squat. We'll just go ahead and talk about that, get that off the board first. I really like the safety bar squat. I'm going to go ahead and put it in S tier as well, just because as you continue to train, your shoulder recovery is a limited, uh, limited resource, so to speak. In addition, None of us have been training optimally since the beginning. So a lot of us has been using bad form with, say, our presses, for example, or with squats, for example, that just ate up our shoulders to the point where we get shoulder pain when we do barbell squats or on bench press if we don't keep that recovery economy in check. Safety bar squats don't stress your shoulder at all. In addition to that, they're going to work your upper back and, quite honestly, your quads 
more than a like a high bar squat would for the same amount of weight. What I'm saying is it has a better stimulus to fatigue ratio. Now, it's not as good as using the most amount of weight possible versus a barbell squat. But if you're just looking for pure bodybuilding and just squatting in a way that doesn't eat into your recovery for pressing and then every other exercise you're using in your program, if you're someone that's like that, this is always a good pick. It also has good carryover to your deadlift exercises in comparison to a barbell squat, for, you know, for people that care about that. Now, we did want to talk about the safety bar good morning, so I am going to look through here and find that. The safety bar good morning is an exercise that I really like for trainees to do if they have access to it versus a straight bar. The reason for it being is that one, just like we talked about with the safety bar squat, you're not limited by, you know, how hurt your shoulders are to perform the exercise. In addition to that, it's actually even more out of less weight than a good morning is just because the bar is going to start up higher on your neck. Because of that as well, it's going to put your uh, lower back in deflection or at least try to. So you're going to get a more powerful stimulus on your entire lower back. Your whole spinal erector, honestly, from your lower back all the way through your mid back and everything going up to your neck. The first time that I did safety bar good mornings, and I did them with the with the camber pointing up, which is like an even harder version of the safety bar good morning. I felt a pump that went from my neck down to my glutes for the better part of four days. So it's just the overall much more potent stimulus, especially if you use that camber upside down. Now, the reason why the camber pointing upside down is harder is because it just pitches you forward more That's the and puts the weight more in front of you. Same thing with the safety bar squat. So if you use the, the camber upside down, Dan Green likes to say they're pretty close to a front squat in terms of, you know, their, their difficulty. Now, going right into our next exercise, the trap bar deadlift high handle. We're using my boy Alex for the picture here. The high handle trap bar deadlift is an exercise that is really good and it gets disrespected a little bit about by people that, you know, have a power lifting focus. Now, there are some perennial truths to it. It's not an exercise that's going to have the most carryover to a conventional deadlift, but there are a large portion of people that don't care about that. You know what I mean? What you get with it is a pull, like a concentric pulling exercise and slightly a, a squatting exercise as well that'll develop that ability to push things off the floor. It could be a good accessory as well if you're someone that struggles with using your legs on deadlift and just pull them with your back. But I really like these just because it is an exercise where you're able to get a, you know, a heavily loaded barbell movement that, you know, if you're someone with a lower back injury, that will still allow you to lift through that hip hinging continuum, I guess you could say, while also sparing your lower back. I do think that in terms of overall utility, a regular deadlift is better just because a strong deadlift is going to make you strong at so many more things than a strong trap bar deadlift will. That's not to say if you don't have a 1,000 pound trap bar deadlift or something like that, you're not going to be strong at everything else, but you need less weight with a deadlift to be strong at everything else. I'm also going to put deficit deadlifts in that B tier slot. The only reason why I don't put them in A tier right along conventional deadlifts is because I don't feel like it adds a whole lot to the table in terms of movement variability. It just pretty much addresses a very specific deadlifts with or a very specific weakness with deadlifts in particular. Outside of that, there's no reason why you shouldn't use some other hip hinges like your main movement. So it, by definition, it doesn't have much utility. The reason why I don't put deadlifts in A tier or S tier and I have them in A tier is because everything that you think of with a deadlift in terms of its benefits, a squat does it better, but it has less it's less flexible in terms of the training economy. So there are some people where deadlift is their favorite exercise. Beautiful. Deadlifts are chatty. They're a great exercise. But if you had to pick one or the other, if I told you like, look, you have to train to fight 
an alien overlord that's going to come to Earth and you have two years to train. You're going to focus your training around squats versus deadlifts and do some other posterior chain exercise for your posterior chain because this is going to take a lot more of your training economy than this. And for the recreational lifter that doesn't have to train squat, bench, and deadlift simultaneously, that's a lot more versatile. Likewise, there aren't as many variations of deadlift as with a squat, and you're not really working your quads at all with a deadlift. There are some people that say, well, deadlifts are a quad exercise. Well, only if you consider a quarter squats a quad exercise, because that's the most range of motion you're getting from a deadlift. They're not uninvolved. They're a great contributor to it, but they're just not contributing a lot to the effective range of motion that you would need your quads for them to grow. Next, we're going to go to the front squat. The front squat is an awesome exercise if you're someone that can do them uh, properly. I'm going to put them in A tier just because although they offer literally all the same like strength and functional benefits of a safety bar squat, because not everyone can do them effectively or have the mobility to get the most utility out of them, they have somewhat of a barrier of entry. But every situation where you could use a safety bar squat, you could also use a front squat, in my opinion. Chest supported T-bar row. This is my favorite, bro. This is one of my favorite back exercises. I'm not going to put it in S tier just because... Well, a few things. So like a seal row has a lot of variation to it where you can work different like angles with your back, different ranges of motion, things like that. Typically with a, a T-bar row, you're looking right at it. You have one grip with it. You have one or two grips. You don't have anything in between. With a seal row, you can do dumbbells, which your grip can be anything between 90 and zero degrees. They're really good. They're one of the best exercises. I might even it might even sneak in the S tier, but I could have an argument for A tier as well. We're going to put it in S tier though just cuz it's one of my favorite exercises. Kettlebell swings. Kettlebell swings get a little disrespected in my opinion. They don't have as much utility as say these exercises up here, like you're not going to get super strong or super big doing kettlebell swings. But what you can develop is, you know, power production. It's a good warm up exercise for just waking your hips up for bigger hip hinges. It's a good conditioning tool. And it's a good tool to add extra volume into your posterior chain that you can recover from very easily. Plus a heavy kettlebell swing feels cool. Leg extensions. Leg extensions get disrespected. So there are some people that think like leg extensions are awful for your knees. No, it's the way that you're doing leg extensions. I'm going to make a video talking about how to do them properly. But if you're doing them in such a way that your knees are impinging on themselves, yeah, they're bad for your knees. But what you have with a leg extension is an exercise that you can apply free quad volume to. That's never not a valuable thing. It's not going to get you strong, but it is going to contribute to helping you get bigger. It's the only leg exercise besides like a sissy squat that might even help it get in the B tier that works that fully shortened uh, position of the quads. You can't really do that with a squat. 45 degree back extensions. These are really good. I'm going to put them in A tier. I'm not going to put them in S tier along with the 90 degree version just because they're limited in range of motion typically. And then the contraction that you get on your spinal erectors isn't quite as good, in my opinion, nor with the glutes or anything like that. But it is a better hamstring exercise, I would say, just because of the joint angle. So it's more similar to like a deadlift or a pull off the floor than this would be just because of the way that they're built. But they're both like, you know, between S and A tier, like, dude, you can't go wrong with either one. So we're going to do the seal row. The seal row is a really good exercise. Like I said, it has a, a lot of variation to it that, in my opinion, helps it edge out the chest-supported T-bar row, in my opinion. 
just because you have the competition seal row, you have dumbbell seal rows, you have seal rows with the cambert bar, you have seal rows with the football bar, you have single arm seal rows. Like there's a lot of different ways that you can do them and that just offers variation to your training. You can't do this really like more than once and have different variation with it throughout the week. Like you have two grips to it. That's two different ways you could do it and include it in your training program per week. You could do a different variation of seal row every day and be training a different part of your back. On top of that, with both of these exercises, what you'll find when you get stronger is that if you're training your lower body a lot, particularly with like a heavy hip hinge, like a stiff legged deadlift, or if you're someone that just naturally hinges a lot with your squats, your lower back recovery is going to be a limited resource. So these allow you to train your upper back in absence of your lower back, and that's never not a good thing for bodybuilding. So another reason why we're going to have the dumbbell row actually in A tier, I would say. The only reason I wouldn't have it in S tier is because, you know, there's not a whole lot of variation that you can have with a dumbbell row in terms of the implements that you can use with them. And then just plus dumbbells are kind of a pain in the ass to source these days. Unless you go to a commercial gym, you're not really going to have easy access to dumbbells. They're very expensive, I guess is what I'm trying to say. For you to get a full set of even up to 50 dumbbells, that's a lot of money. But everything that applies to, you know, this and this also applies to this. It's just there's there's not as much easy access to it. You're going to have to buy like a safety bar, for example, or, you know what I'm saying, like an assault bike. But a full set of dumbbells is going to cost you a lot more than a safety bar. Bells of Steel is selling a really good safety squat bar for like 250 bucks. You might spend 250 bucks for like a pair of dumbbells. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just not just not tenable in terms of the price. So we talked a lot about the Dr. Mike style leg press. Now range of motion equal. Range of motion equal is the important indicator here. I'm also going to put belt squats in S tier just simply because not only are they not fatiguing your, you know, you know axially loading your spine just like with a leg press, they're also decompressing your spine a little bit. Like there are some people that'll say that's a bad thing potentially. And it makes sense logically because their reasoning with saying that is, is because it's decompressing your spine, it's also pulling and compressing your pelvis inwards. My counter to that is, is that's not problematic in people that are only doing belt squats once or twice a week. That's just not problematic in my opinion. But what they do offer is really easy quad tonnage, really easy tonnage to everything involved in your squat in terms of your lower back, it's not working your lower back at all through the range of motion that it would need to to have the, that one-to-one carryover. But if you're doing them in addition to some sort of barbell squat or a safety bar squat, it's like a one plus one equals three thing. So this is a one plus one equals three with squats. This is a one plus one equals three with squats. And this is a one plus one equals three with squats. This is the leverage squat machine. Again, if you can get an ATG range of motion on your machine, that's what we're talking about. Same thing. It's minimally stressing your back. Um, it does stress it a little bit just because it is bearing down on your spine a little bit. But because it's a, it's a machine and you're staying relatively upright, it's just not it's just not fatiguing your spine the way a, a way a barbell squat would. So I'm gonna have it in S tier, but I I would say it's just like half a half a notch below these. Next is the dumbbell bench, decline dumbbell bench. I really like these specifically for someone that is looking for an exercise that will allow them to get in more chest pressing volume, and they're not necessarily looking for any performance increase. A dumbbell decline bench or a dumbbell anything decline bench with a barbell or anything is going to be easier than the flat barbell bench press. You're going to be tempted to use a lot more weight on this than you will with a barbell flat bench press or an incline bench press. That's a mistake just because you're taking away from one of the main reasons why you would use this. For this reason, I might even put it in A tier. You can get a lot of pressing volume in with like, say, like equivalent load to your flat benching. 
for less fatigue. And that's going to be really good for your triceps specifically. I really like decline presses for people with longer arms that typically aren't able to fit in a whole lot of extra tricep work. It's just one of those exercises that you can pick from from that category that'll work for a long-armed bencher. But just in general, it's a high stimulus, lower fatigue exercise if you're using proper weight selection there. Now, floor press is the other exercise that I would say is a good tricep movement for people with longer arms. Just simply because you're not using your pecs as much and you can do more reps at a higher percentage than your regular bench press just because the range of motion is truncated. Your one rep maxes, if you care about that, are going to be relatively the same as your um, bench press, this being a little bit lower, but you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you bench, like say for example, 225 for 10 reps with a, like a competition style bench press, you're going to do 225 for like 15 reps and then also have like, you know, the same or slightly lower of a one rep max with your floor press. It's also really good if you're someone that has shorter arms and you get a full range of motion, like you could touch your your chest to the bar. For people like that, I might even put it on the same level as Larson press, just because at that point, you have an exercise that not only is not fatiguing your body at all in terms of your lower body, it's also a little bit safer, one. And two, you're also breaking up the concentric eccentric chain when you touch and you pause on the floor, and you're just not doing that with a, any pause on a Larson press at all. So I, I might even argue that if you're someone that's doing like a deficit floor press or you have short arms and you could touch your, your chest with a floor press, that that's better than Larson press for that reason. You know, they do the same thing. It's just the deficit floor press or the, you know, short armed floor press do the same thing. So we talked about like the big meaty movements. Let's talk about some of this uh, isolation and ab movements. That's fun. So GHD sit-ups are something that I do all the freaking time, man. They are my favorite ab exercise. I'm putting them in S tier just because they're easily loadable. They work your abs really well. They're easy to progress. They work your abs, which is going to have carryover to bracing on every other movement. They're just the overall best exercise for your six-pack muscles, in my opinion. Now, in terms of exercises that you would use for the other functions of your abs, there's a few other ones that I really like. I'm not including every ab exercise under the sun just because you don't need to do very many of them to fulfill every function. I'm also putting the oblique bends in S tier, specifically doing them on a 45 degree back extension, just because they allow you to work not only your obliques, but your QL muscles. Your QL muscles are something in your lower back where if it gets tweaked, that'll cause a lot of pain that you, you, it'll be like, a, it'll be a pain that you've never felt before. And you'll think something's like really wrong with you. This is an exercise that you could do to treat and prevent that. In my experience, talk to your doctor, of course, if you have anything pain related, but more than likely, if you work with a physical, physical therapist, this is going to be something that they include in your regimen. And then just, I say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You do this just in the midst of your regular training, you're going to have blocky obliques and strong QLs, and it's going to prevent anything from happening. I also really like the ab wheel. I remember the first time I did an ab wheel. Every time I do the ab wheel, I don't often do it just because I just don't do them very often. But the first time I did an ab wheel, every exercise for, or every muscle in my abdominal section from my lower back to my core to to everything just felt like hamburger meat. This this it gives you like such an isometric contraction, you'll never believe it. They're really cheap. You can do them anywhere. There's easy regressions of them. You can use band assistance. You can use, you know, ab wheel on your knees. You can do them on your toes. You can do them all the way to the floor, halfway. There's like there's always some regression where you can work that trunk stabilization aspect of your core. This does it way better than planks. Planks are boring. Planks are boring, and then they're not a dynamic movement like this. With, with, like with this, you can count reps out. That's going to make it infinitely better for your mental acuity and for your enjoyment with the exercise. Everybody hates planks, and it's because doing anything for time is boring, just like you statically sitting there. No one wants to do that. 
Now, other isolations or smaller muscle groups, I really like the wrist roller. I'm going to put it in B tier just because it's not like the most amazing exercise, but it's like the most intuitive, lowest barrier of entry forearm exercise that you can do that's going to solve a lot of potential problems that you might have with your grip. Forearm pain, this is a really good warm up for your elbows for bench press. It's just a really good brolic forearm exercise that's really easy for most people to do. You can DIY that pretty easily even without that fancy wrist roller. Now, we're going to do one more isolation before we get back to the big boys. Let's see. I really like the tricep rope pushdowns. We're going to put those in S tier. So in the past, I would have put them in A tier. I'm putting them in S tier now just because I've found some newfound utility with them for long armed bench pressers or people who are just doing a lot of bench press volume in general. This exercise is super therapeutic for your elbows if you're doing a lot of bench pressing, especially if you're someone with longer arms where one rep of bench press fatigues you a lot more than one rep of bench press than, with, than someone with shorter arms. This is also going to work on your triceps, which is not something that you can often do as a long-armed bench presser if you're doing a lot of bench press already. You find that if you do anything like a jam press or a French press or a standing overhead tricep extension, it's just going to eat your elbows up and regress your bench press because you're dipping into a recovery source that's gone. Like You're using all of your elbow flexion and extension possible with your rows and your bench press if you're training them optimally in most cases. But the tricep rope push down, there's something magical about it, man. It, it's just, it just allows you to get in that extra tricep work. It also just creates this nice blood flow in your elbows, which actually increases your recovery. Awesome S-tier exercise. Everybody should be including that in their program, in my opinion. We're going to do another big boy movement. So let's do, I'm going to do the snatch rib deadlifts just because Klokov was staring at me. Snatch rib deadlifts are really good. I'm going to put them, if I have to compare them to like the, the conventional deadlift or the safety bar good morning or these other exercises, I can't put them on par with that. Just simply because I don't feel like it does anything that these exercises do to the same extent. If I put it in A tier, it's going to be like at the back of A tier, below these other, you know, the back extension, the front squat, the conventional deadlift, the safety bar, good morning. Just because it has higher, you know, axial loading than the good morning, it's not as specific for strength as the conventional deadlift. It's not working your quads as much as front squats, but it's giving you a good blend of everything. So you're going to use a decent amount of weight on this. Not as much as your conventional deadlift, but more than this. Right around what you're front squatting, more than likely, if you have a strong front squat. Um, it's going to work your, your lats a little bit. It's not really actively using them like it would on a row or anything like that. It's a good jack-of-all-trades lift. It's really good as an accessory if you're looking to do something non-specific. So you could use this as a main exercise and get really strong at it and get really big. You could use it as a non-specific exercise to build your deadlift though. But if you do primarily this, this obviously is a big deviation from just doing a conventional deadlift. So your, your mileage will vary with that the stronger that you get. Another good one. So this one slightly overrated in my opinion and I have a lot of personal experience with the reverse with the reverse hack squat it's a good exercise there's just no reason for you to do it instead of a regular hack squat I guess I should say it doesn't work your quads as well typically it doesn't you know it recruits your lower back a little bit more i've found especially if you're on the taller side which is just defeating the entire purpose of you doing a hack squat you're doing a hack squat to not use your lower back at all and to preferentially stimulate your quads if i wanted to do like a regress squat variation i would do a regress squat variation i wouldn't be wasting my time doing reverse hack squats johnny candido really likes them i think they work for him because of his build, I don't think that anyone that isn't 
on the shorter side would really benefit from doing them. And then even I think that he would benefit more from doing just like a regular a regular hack squad. Johnny Candido is a savant, so I'm never going to say anything that he does as wrong for him. But I think that was just one of those exercises that, you know, he was trying it out and it was working for him and he kind of was on his, his own hype train. But I don't think it's better than a regular hack squat for most people. Where's Tom Platts at? Because I think I used him for the, the hack squat picture. Here you go, right here. The regular hack squat is an exercise that I definitely am going to put in S tier along with all of those other, you know, that category of exercises. Big quad stimulus, low fatigue on the lower back. Really good for overall size. You're just not going to have the hip strength compared to like a barbell squat or if you were training deadlifts or something. But in terms of like leg size and overall strength, excellent. So single leg work, and I picked the Bulgarian split squat because I feel like all single leg work, there's different benefits to each and I'm not going to go into them necessarily, but just in general, single leg work, I'm going to put an A tier at the top of A tier just because it works a lot of different things that don't necessarily have to do with hypertrophy. You can use single leg work to condition your knees for really deep squatting. You can use single leg work to really condition your, your adductors for really deep squatting. What you'll find is when you get stronger at barbell squats or anything like that, um, common injuries are in the knees and in the adductors. You can use like, like a 12 to 20 rep set of single leg work with light weight to get some token hypertrophy, but also to prime your muscles to be able to do these big boy movements more. They're just really invaluable in any training program. The only reason I don't put them in S tier is because they don't have as much capacity for growth as these movements, just obviously because you can't load them as heavily. But what they do offer is a unique stimulus to your legs. So you're working your legs and the muscles involved in your squat in a mid-range position that you really wouldn't be able to quite as well with the squat. That's some gigabrain stuff that we're not going to get into today. If you want more info, watch my final answer on leg bodybuilding. Smith machine squats. So Smith machine squats, a lot of people will say they should go down here, right? Or, you know, at best, D tier. Smith machine squats fulfill this exact same thing that hack squats do. If you're a hack squat enjoyer, tell me why you wouldn't like a Smith machine hack squat. They're the same exercise. In fact, the only reason why I would have someone do this over this or this over that is if they didn't have access to like a, like a hack squat because this is the exact same thing. So if you go to a Planet Fitness, you can get absolutely jacked legs doing a Smith Machine squat. Ch uh, Charlie, uh, the big Korean dude that runs with Dr. Mike and all of them, he does Smith Machine squats and his legs are the size of horse legs, quite literally. If you want to see some beef cannons, check out Charlie. I think his name's Charlton Banks on Instagram. He does Smith machine squats and hacks and everything like that. Rarely does barbell squats anymore. Used to be a 800 something pound competition squatter. He does these primarily and his legs are bigger and stronger than ever. Smith machine squats are really slept on. They fit that, that big quad stimulus, low back fatigue bill quite well. So this is a chatty picture of the Lou race. The Lou race is, so I, I, I used to really enjoy doing these. I'm not going to put them on the same level as all of these movements, just because I feel like you could do with, you could go without doing Lou raises, but you could still find a lot of opportunity to use all of these in your training program. Like, I'm not going to say that they're as good as a Powell raise or this, you know, cable rear delt fly or dips. What they are really good for though is as a warm up exercise. And if you have lagging shoulders in terms of like their size, they're really good. They're really good for opening up your scaps and improving your mobility. See, and I don't want to put them on the same level as a shrug. So we're going to say they're the top of C tier, almost breaking into B tier. 
but they're not quite B tier in my opinion, just because they don't have the most utility. Like they're not gonna build your shoulders as well as a bench press or you know any shoulder exercise or any row. Rows can work the side delts really well. That's a video that I'm gonna be making uh, in the near future. It just depends upon like your arm path, just like with everything else. Your arm path with rows determines what gets biased the most. Speaking of rows, the upright row, let's see. The upright row is another exercise that say would go in that C tier category. They do kind of the same thing that Lou raises do, but not really in that if you have a particular issue with your shoulder, particularly external rotation, they're really good for working your shoulder through that range of motion and allowing you to get blood flow in that particular movement pattern. Just moving your muscles through particular movement patterns is invaluable for injury prevention or if you get an injury, not necessarily just having strong muscles in general. So like just having strong shoulders and rear delts and the pecs and having a strong row is not necessarily going to prevent like shoulder pain. If you're not doing like some form of overhead pressing more often than not, even if it's just like warm up work, you're going to find that you get some shoulder issues. I found that myself um, in my training. Upright rows are something that I used in that instance to kind of rehabilitate that. And just in general, like they give your Side delts a really good range of motion. They train your traps. They're just not going to do particularly a whole lot beyond that. So they're a C tier exercise for that reason. So overhead tricep extensions, those are D tier, man. Like even for people that like do them and like them, they always say that they hurt their elbows. Strict curls are an exercise that I would also put in this C tier just because they're not working the bicep as well as like a pelican curl or anything like that, but they are an exercise that you could use as your main curling exercise that you're feeding with these other exercises as an accessory, but I just don't feel like they're as good of builders overall as the, the other curls that you would do to build them. You would pretty much just only do a strict curl if you had limited equipment and or you just wanted to be good at strict curls, in my opinion. Now, another tricep exercise, I don't know if I included JM presses on here, but I would put them in C tier. Weighted push-ups. So, weighted push-ups are going to go in this A tier. Maybe breaking into S tier if you have like a weighted vest. For most people, though, I'm going to put them in A tier just because most of us either have to rely on putting weights on our back or using a backpack. A backpack is a good option. It's just not as easily loadable as like a Kensui vest. If you have a Kensui vest or like some sort of plate loaded vest where you can get in and out of it easily and then just load a bunch of weight on it, I think that weighted push ups are just in general a better hypertrophy exercise and bench press just because you can do things with a, a push-up like add a deficit to it, add an incline to it or decline to it. It offers a lot of movement variability that you would have to like buy a bunch of bars to achieve with on the bench press. And then on top of that, it's working your serratus. It's really intuitive for most people to move their scaps properly on a weighted push-up versus a bench press for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's just because we've been told by uh, boomer power lifters that our scaps aren't supposed to move on bench press, so it's just a self-imposed mental limitation. But still easier for most people to use their scaps properly on a weighted push-up than a bench press. Plus, just most people just enjoy them better. The reason why I put them so far ahead of weighted dips, for example, and weighted dips might even be able to get into, into this uh, mm, we're going to keep them there. Just simply because I don't feel like they work the prime movers as well from a bodybuilding perspective. And then just some people get sternum pain that doesn't have anything to do with form, I would say. You know, like the barrier of entry for dips is, is much higher than like a, a weighted push-up in my opinion. But they're both excellent exercises.
So like if you what like dips more than push ups and none of that shit mattered to you, you can do dips. It's not a a real big deal. The only reason, even in that case, I would still put dips at a higher level is that they have more direct carryover to another S tier exercise compared to a dip. Like if you get strong at dips, you're gonna get strong at bench press, but the carryover won't be as direct. She's one of my uh I have two people that I'm training to surpass. One is uh, one of my first inspirations, Freaky D, Dennis Arnold. Learned how to bench press from his YouTube videos. Um, obviously got the Larson press from him. And the other is Mr. Eric, Mr. Bugenhag, and Mr. WWE wrestler. The low bar, the, the low handle trap bar deadlift, I am going to put in A tier. But not on the same level of A tier as the conventional deadlift, just because it's going to have more direct carryover to a conventional deadlift, just because you can make it into a hip hinge just by the way that you position yourself. And you can't really do that with the high handles. It's given all the same benefits, though. So like it's neutral grip. You don't really have to use straps if you don't want to. Like you see right here, Eric's holding that with his bare hands. You can't. I think that's 650 pounds on that low handle trap bar deadlift. Like you're not going to be able to double overhand 650 pounds unless you're the complete Titan of a human being. Um, they have a better stimulus to fatigue, even equi like equalizing the weight just because they don't recruit your lower back as much by proxy of them being a neutral grip, but they're still going to give you some additional training volume that doesn't fatigue you as much. So I would use them more in like a deadlift centric program. Or if you have a day where like, you know, you have a heavy hip hinge that you're training in your training rotation. This could be something that you put in there. Let's see. Low bar squats. Low bar squats, man. Low bar squats are good. I'm not going to put them anywhere near the same level as a high bar squat just because they eat into your 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 shoulder recovery a little bit more and then for a lot of people they can start to give you like pain in your elbows as well if you're doing a lot of low bar squatting it's still a freaking squat so it's not like a, a d tier exercise i just think the high bar squat is a lot better for overall utility stiff leg deadlifts stiff leg deadlifts are easily an s tier exercise Stiff leg deadlifts offer a better stimulus to your posterior chain and your hamstrings in particular than a conventional deadlift. You can't lift as much weight on it, but positionally what it's doing is it's just making everything in your posterior chain work harder. If you're trying to build muscle or even build strength in these muscles to be able to lift more weight on your deadlift, stiff leg deadlift should always be your first option in my opinion, especially if you pull conventional. Let's see, the Zercher squat. Zercher squat isn't useless. It's pretty bad, though, in my opinion. It's not useless, so it does have a lot of use as a squat exercise if you're in a home gym and you need something lightweight that you can do for a lot of reps to give you like a squat variation. But when you start to go heavy on these, they start to like mutate from a squat into like a mutant partial squat good morning hip hinge freak of an exercise that just is not worth you doing. So the way I like to program them, if I do have someone that has no other option, I like to program them kind of in mind of these variations, but accepting that there's going to be a little bit of axial loading and a little bit of extra upper back involvement. And just programming them for a lot of reps. So if you you know load up like a like two hundred pounds and then do sets of twenty with it, that's going to be your leg accessory. If you use lightweight, you can stay really upright. They're basically like a uh, a front squat in that regard. But once, like I said, you start to get heavy, you start to tip forward, and then it just starts to turn into a mutant hip hinge. It's not a squat at that point. The dumbbell bench press. The dumbbell bench press is an exercise that is really good. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in S tier. And you know why? 
it doesn't lock your arms and to a particular and your your elbows and your wrists into a particular position like a bench press does. So even with great form on a bench press, that is something that is a limited training economy, like a trade training resource, like your elbows and your wrists and your everything in your shoulder that you can't just infinitely do good form bench presses and then that's your only bench training. You're gonna injure yourself. Dumbbell bench allows you to rotate your wrists and your elbows and your arms in and out in like a very natural path. It's just going to feel a lot better than a bench press. So I'm not going to say they're better than a bench press, but for people that are just looking for like a good chest pressing exercise to do, dumbbell bench is equally as valuable. A lot of times if I have a beginner and then like we're trying to work their pecs through a larger range of motion, that the dumbbell bench is definitely something that I would use, you know, in addition to like a weighted push up to help fulfill that particular purpose. Hammer curls are really good, man. Like a lot of people will put them in honestly F tier just because they don't build your biceps very well. They do build your biceps decent, not as well as a pelican curl, but what they're really good at is just um, prehabbing your arms for any sort of pressing workout that you're going to do. That's included in any chest pressing workout. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going to do your light dumbbell bench, your rows, and then your hammer curls, and then band face pulls. That's part of your warm up. Warm ups and making sure that you can actually perform the stuff that's going to get you big in the first place. That's valuable in any training program. I don't care what anybody says. Box jumps. Box jumps are, they're okay. I don't see a lot of reason to do them. Just because I feel like, you know, kettlebell swings might work your hips a little bit better in terms of the explosiveness aspect. They are pretty cool. They're a good conditioning tool. They will be good for like post-activation potentiation for squats. And that's just a giga brain term for you do something explosive or heavy and then you do something less explosive or lighter and then it's going to feel easier. Sissy squats. Sissy squats are... Low key, if I have the leg extensions in B tier, I got to have the sissy squats in A tier just because they're also loadable, but you can do these at home very easily. So just by proxy, they have more utility, but they do pretty much the exact same thing. They're training that uh, shortened position of your quads. And they're also, you see your knees are way over your toes with that. That's also good for if you have any sort of knee pain, you can do some sort of regression of a sissy squat. And that's also going to help you rehabilitate your knees or just make them really strong and injury proof in general. Glute ham raises. Glute ham raises are excellent. I'm going to put them in, I'm going to put them in. A tier, and I'm going to have hamstring curls in S tier when I get to those, just because they don't work the hamstrings quite as well in that shortened position, but they still are a hamstring curl. So if you're someone that, you know, you've, you don't typically include hamstring curls in your training program and you only do stretching exercises like stiff leg deadlifts or good mornings, you're going to have some explosive growth in your hamstrings just because you're working that shortened position and you're just not doing that very much with a stiff leg deadlift. You are a little bit just because they have to shorten a little bit for you to move through the range of motion, but it, this is a more complete shortening of the hamstring than like with a stiff leg deadlift. It's a common misconception like your legs don't shorten at all in a stiff leg deadlift. Nordics. Nordics, dude, are like I'm going to put them just in A tier and not in S tier just because most people aren't strong enough to do them properly, but they're, they're an amazing exercise. Everybody knows about how brutal Nordics are. They're, you know, they're, they're an easy hamstring exercise to include in your program if you're in a home gym or something like that to improve your strength. We're going to talk about the weighted pull-ups a little bit. So... Let's start with everybody's favorite, weighted chin-ups. Weighted chin-ups are an S-tier exercise. Weighted chin-ups work everything in your arms, from your biceps to your grip to your forearms. If you have grip issues, 
doing a weighted pull up or chin up or whatever is going to be like my first go to for people like that. So I'll be like, hey, use some chalk, but just do these, you know, pull ups and your grip's going to improve. And then it always does. You can go from doing weighted pull ups and chin ups and everything like that and go right back into doing deadlifts or something if you hadn't been doing that for a long time and your grip is going to be, your grip's going to be Gucci. These are really good specifically because it's really intuitive to use a lat biased grip. You see how his arms are flush right here? That's going to bias his lats a lot. Neutral grip weighted pull-ups are another exercise I really enjoy that are also going to go in this S tier. What you'll notice, bro, is, is that there are a lot of S tier exercises. Like there are a lot of like banger go-to exercises that you can include in your training program. That's just from different knowledge that we've accumulated over the years in exercise science. But there's a lot of things that like you should be including in your training program. This is like anything. So pretty much here's how it goes. Like S tier is like if you have access to these, you're doing these. A tier is like if you don't have access to these or you just happen to, you know, want to do something different that fulfills a similar function, you're picking something in either A or S tier. And then in anything below that, other than like specific niche exercises where like the power raise, none of those exercises really do it, this and that, you're only doing these because you don't have access to a, uh, an, an S or A tier pretty much. That's kind of how that is, because you might be thinking, why is there so many S tiers? Well, there's a lot of good shit that you can do. Um, the hamstring curl, that's also going to go in S tier. There is no other exercise that works to shorten position of the hamstring better. That's just, you know, infinite utility in any training program. There, there would be an argument for because it's a machine and most people don't have access to it versus like a Nordic, that it could be an A tier, but just by proxy of it being a better exercise, I am going to put it in S tier. Another cool thing about it is, is that it's very easy to load it with a gradient of loading versus with a glute hamstring. With a glute hamstring, you're either strong enough to do one or you're not. You can decrease the difficulty by moving the pad, but if you're too weak to even do one of those, you're fucked, so you need to do a hamstring curl in that case where you can load up 20 pounds if that's what you need. And then if you can't do glute ham raises, you for damn sure can't do Nordics because Nordics are harder. Low incline dumbbell bench press. Low incline dumbbell bench press is really good. I'm also going to put it in S tier. It's not really any different from a flat barbell or a flat dumbbell bench press in terms of how you would program it. So there's small differences in such that like you can move your scaps a little easier on this, you know, the incline version of the dumbbell bench press. It's working your upper chest a little bit more. It's working through a slightly larger range of motion. But overall, like I would just use in a bodybuilding program or even a powerlifting program, I would use them as variations of one another. So you could Milk the incline dumbbell bench press and then swap it out for the, the flat dumbbell bench press and vice versa. Excellent exercise. Dumbbell shoulder press is, I'm going to be honest with you, bro. Like if you're doing a lot of bench pressing and dips and weighted push-ups and any sort of chest pressing, you're working your front delts a lot. So I can't put it on the same tier as those exercises. It is really good though. And if you have lagging shoulders for whatever reason, and you don't want to spend the training economy to just get a bigger bench press or to train those chest pressing movements, it's always going to be more beneficial to work compound movements or isolations that are working the target muscle that you're looking for in absence of ones that you're not looking to build. So like, for example, something that I say that people misinterpret is if you have long arms you don't need as much isolation work to get bigger arms. But if you want the biggest arms possible, you would remove some of that bench press volume, you would remove some of that rowing and pulling volume and replace it with isolations because they're always going to do the job of working the biceps or triceps better than a compound movement because they're working them in absence of those big muscles that can potentially take over. Dumbbell pullovers. Dumbbell pullovers. Natural hypertrophy loves these. I'm going to also put them in, 
you know what, man? I'm going to put them in A tier just because they're working that fully stretched position of the lats very well in a way that not even like weighted pull-ups do. They don't do a whole lot outside of that other than like some people say they expand your rib cage. They're just really good, easy lat tonnage that is really quite honestly easy to just sprinkle in your program at any time that's going to really help you bring up your lats. I do like if you can, you know, and you have to actually have this to be able to do it this way, but if you have like a Swiss bar, you can use a neutral grip and that's really going to allow you to keep your elbows tucked in and really work your lats. But just in general, they're really good. I put them on the same level as the straight arm pull down in terms of the tier. I do like pullovers better just because everybody has access to like a barbell or a dumbbell to do pullovers. But not everyone has access to a cable station, so they don't have as much utility for most people. The Swiss bar bench. The Swiss bar bench is, I would say it's an S tier exercise in that it works. It's Swiss bar bench to bench press is to bench press as safety bar squat is to squat. I, that better makes sense. What I'm saying is, is that it's a bench press that you know, spares your shoulder recovery. It works your pecs through uh, a slightly more optimal range of motion and joint angle. And it's still a bench press, you know what I mean? So for anyone in general, even if you're someone looking for an accessory to build your bench press, this is a good option for you. Swiss bars aren't very expensive. So even if you had to buy one, I think Titan sells one for like a hundred bucks. They're not very expensive. So the barrier to entry isn't very high. Let's see. I don't know why. There, there's multiples of these three. The cable rows. Cable rows, listen, man. Cable rows, you would think, are like on par with seal rows or the chest-supported T-bar rows. You, your lower back does get worked here a good, a good bit, unless you're doing like the seated ghetto version that Alex does, in which case I would definitely put them in, you know, up here as well, but the, the the gym version of it doesn't give you the best range of motion on your lats or anything in your back, in my opinion. It's not bad. It's just if you had to pick it versus, you know, any of those exercises, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that, in my opinion. But they're good, and if you like doing them, you're not going to get a huge difference between if you were doing that versus a seal row. It's going to be noticeable, but you know. You're not going to have a small back by repping out the whole fucking stack on cable rows. You know what I'm saying? Barbell rows. Barbell rows, I don't put them on the same tier as the chest supported rows for, you know, just building the upper back. But they are a really good exercise, particularly for the bodybuilder that knows what they're doing with their body. So if you're a noob that doesn't know how to keep your back fully extended... Barbell rows are not going to be a good exercise for you. Likewise, if you're someone that is training a lot of deadlifts and a lot of squats and good mornings and shit like that, the lower back fatigue that you would accrue by fully extending your back and keeping it fully extended is going to eat in your recovery for those exercises. But for the bodybuilder that doesn't necessarily care about movement patterns or specific exercises, and only cares about working movement patterns and specific muscle groups, this is a really good exercise because here, the bodybuilder might not be doing deadlifts at all. The bodybuilder might be doing freaking back extensions, which are very low fatigue. So they might not mind doing barbell rows and getting an extra, a little bit extra lower back tonnage. It might even be something that they use you know, in, you know, in replacement of a back extension. There's also working their upper back. Why I say the bodybuilder that knows what they're doing with their body, they can keep their body, their back fully extended, and they can use good form on these. If you're someone that can do that, they're really good exercise. They're going to get you yoked, and they're going to get your lower back nice and strong. Dr. Mike programs them all the time for a reason. I talk about them not as favorably as the chest-supported rows just because I am someone that trains their lower body a lot, you know, with those, those bigger movements. So. It makes more sense for me specifically to use the chest supported rows versus the freestanding ones. But even, you know, 
in my training rotation right now. I'm I'm doing them just because they're a really good exercise, and I don't mind that they take a little bit away from my lower body. Um, the payoff press. The payoff press is going to go in S tier along with everything else. Like you should be doing a payoff press. It's training that anti-rotational strength. And it's really easy to set up. You just get a band. We're almost at the end, everybody. So calf raises. Calf raises are, they train your calves really well. And they're a good, they're, you know what? They're low-key a good warm-up for squats just because you can use them to stretch your, your, your calves out, which is going to help with squat depth a little bit. So I'm going to put them in B tier, but I mean, they don't really do much else besides that. Smith machine. This is either Smith machine bench press or incline bench press. We're going to go ahead and count it as incline bench press. Incline bench press is good. I don't feel like it has overall as much utility as, as all of these. I would really just would use it, you know, as an accessory to help one of these chest pressing exercises. So we have the neck extension. The neck extension is kind of one of those exercises that is really good at what it does, but it doesn't do much else besides that. So I'm not going to put it high on the tier list. This is the rack pull. The rack pull is not a good exercise. So here's what a rack pull does. It allows you to get in concentric pulling volume, and it's not as like deleterious on your recovery as a pull from the floor or a stiff legged deadlift. But I, it, that begs the question: so, what are you, what are you, what are you doing if you're doing a rack pull? Like, what are you doing in addition to it to even warrant doing this in the first place? So, the range of motion typically isn't going to be as good as a trap bar deadlift. It's going to beat up the bar, unlike a trap bar deadlift. It's just not doing anything that this doesn't do, but a lot better, and it doesn't destroy the bar. Um, even in terms of deadlift carryover, this is still going to have better carryover because it's recruiting the muscles used in the deadlift better. And even this doesn't have the best carryover to a deadlift per se, especially if like, especially if you're going above the knee. Like, obviously, without you know. Rack pulls above the knee are not working your traps as good as an overhead press or a shrug or a trap bar shrug, which is an exercise I don't think I included in the pictures, but if I had to include it somewhere, I'd put it in you know B tier because it works your traps really well. Alex just made a video about that. Really good exercise. It's just not a good exercise, man. Like Nobody does rack pulls anymore. This, the iliac pull down, the single arm lat pull down. Um, so this is kind of one of those nerd exercises that just <laughs> happens to be good at what it does. I don't think it has as much utility as a pull up or a pull over or anything like that. I'm not going to lie to you, but it does work your lat from a pre-stretched position. It does work it in that optimal arm path. It does work it from that optimal joint angle. It's just limited by the load that you can use on it. And that's just, it's almost always going to limit your capacity to like push it in your training. So if you're using that as your main exercise to increase your lat size, you're going to be limited by the load that you use on it. And that's never a good thing. Weighted pull-ups. Weighted pull-ups are obviously S tier. There's not, there's going to be some fucking nerd that, doesn't like weighted chin-ups for some reason to cope for their mediocre weighted pull-up strength. But there's no real difference in terms of programming between a neutral, a chin-up, or a weighted pull-up. They're all fulfilling the same purpose. Weighted chin-up isn't even necessarily easier than a weighted pull-up a lot of the time if you don't have a fucking weak upper back. It, there's only a significant difference in your performance there if your upper back is like a paper thin week let's see this is the seated non-back supported smith machine overhead press so big z is the strongest overhead presser of all time if you don't know who that is just buy off a nickname alone google him shame on you but this is a really good exercise for bringing up 
your um, bringing up your shoulders. Now, I know I said that that isn't necessarily something that you can't do with a bench press, but the reason why I put this in A tier is just because the, the, the eccentric that you have to eat on a Smith machine is half of what makes doing exercises on a Smith machine so beneficial. You can't just allow gravity to take over like you would with a barbell. You have to eat that eccentric. And another thing that a Smith machine does is something very sneaky that I don't think I've heard anyone ever talk about. It doesn't matter how hard you push for the most part on a Smith machine exercise. Because of the way Smith machines are built, there's a finite maximum rep speed going up or down on the concentric or eccentric that you can achieve. So like this could be the most excruciating rep of your life, but it's still going to be really slow, like exactly the same tempo as it was when you were fresh. Likewise, if you're pushing really hard, you're not going to be able to terminate the set any quicker. So Smith machine is really good for bodybuilding for that reason, just because it fixes like a finite time under tension. Sumo deadlift, I'm going to go ahead and put that in B tier. It's, it's still a deadlift. It's kind of like for athletic capacity, there's no reason to pick it over a regular deadlift or a squat. There's really no reason to do it other than if you want to get good at sumo deadlifts because it doesn't work the adductors as well as a belt squat does. It doesn't work the glutes as well as a hip thrust does. It doesn't work the quads as well as the squat does. It doesn't work the hip extensors as well as the deadlift does or the spinal erectors as well as the stiff leg deadlift does. It just doesn't It doesn't do anything particularly well for you to warrant doing it in your program, in my opinion, over those other things. But if you enjoy doing them, you certainly wouldn't be a DL if you chose to get really strong at sumo deadlifts. You would still get jacked. I did include the trap bar shrug. I just couldn't really tell at first while I was looking at it. Trap bar shrug. I'm gonna put this. It, it's excellent. Like it's it. No other exercise works your traps as well as a trap bar shrug. It's called a fucking trap bar, guys. But it doesn't really have any utility outside of that besides working your traps really good. So I can't put it any higher than that. And then last but not least, we have um, the Smith machine bench press. The Smith machine bench press. I'm going to go ahead and put it in A tier. It's not as good or it doesn't have as much utility as these S tier exercises. I might even sneak it in like a notch below if it was in the S tier. But the reason why I'm going to put it in A tier is because it's not... It doesn't have the same carryover to other chest presses in terms of like if you get really good at this... You're not necessarily get really good at that or this or that or anything. But from a pure bodybuilding perspective, like we talk about with the Smith machines, they make a finite like rep speed. So like it doesn't matter how hard or fast you push, your eccentric is going to be the same speed unless you like just completely like suicide mode, allow it to decapitate you. Um, and that's all, man. Like this is my full tier list feel like we explained the benefits of each pretty well. We included the accessories for you guys to refer to. This video is going to be fully time stamped, probably not by me. I'm just going to be honest with you because this is an hour and a half long video. I'm going to leave it to one of the chads in the comment section to go ahead and do that for us. Just some final words to give you guys in terms of, you know, if again, you see an exercise that you really like or one that you really don't like that you don't feel is properly placed, this is just my opinion. This is my experience. If you have a dissenting opinion or something to add or some sort of addendum you would like me to add, just approach me logically about it. I always allow criticisms and civil discourse, but a lot of the people that offer criticisms are like, People with soggy Cheetos for brains, I like to say. So the way that they do it, I just I just dismiss them just because who are you to be rude to anybody for no reason? You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't come here for that. Ultimately, we'll go to the gym. We use all these exercises because we want to improve our bodies. We want to be healthy. We want to be more confident. We want to do all these different things that are super awesome. So real quick, S tier. 
really good exercises that you should be including in your training program unless you have some reason not to, like you don't have access to one of the implements. A tier, mostly just variations of things that you can do up here if you like doing them better or if you don't have access to them. B tier, it's the same thing. So these are, you know, not quite as good as the A tiers in terms of efficacy or overall utility. But if you don't have access to something up here or you just prefer doing something, you're still going to get super jacked if you do these. And then C tier is like these are more limited utility, more so just warm up exercises, exercises that are OK, but there's no reason to pick one of these if you have access to them. And then D tier is like, you know. Very limited utility. You pretty much only do them if you have no other choice or if you really super are fucking in love with doing rack pulls or zercher squats, you can do them. And then F tier is like, why are you doing this exercise? You're doing the exercise because you found it on T Nation. Anyway, if y'all have any questions or any comments, like I said, please leave them down below. I appreciate you. Y'all have a good one.